Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. It's Sunday, and so we'll be reading from the uh, main text in A Course in Miracles. We've been reading chapter nine, nine and uh, which is uh, the acceptance of the atonement. And we are on section five at this point, the unhealed healer. The ego's plan for forgiveness is far more widely used than God's. This is because it is undertaken by unhealed healers, and it is therefore of the ego. Let us consider the unhealed healer more carefully now. By definition, he or she is trying to give up what he has not yet received. If an unhealed healer is a theologian, for example, they may begin with the premise, I am a miserable sinner, and so are you. If they're a psychotherapist, they're more likely to start with the equally incredible belief that attack is real for both themselves and the patient, but that it does not matter for either of them. I have repeatedly said that beliefs of the ego cannot be shared, and this is why they are unreal. How then can uncovering them make them real? Every healer who searches fantasies for truth must be unhealed because he does not know where to look for truth and therefore does not have the answer to the problem of healing. There is an advantage to bringing nightmares into awareness, but only to teach that they are not real and that anything they contain is meaningless. The unhealed healer cannot do this because he does not believe it. All unhealed healers follow the ego's, ego's plan for forgiveness in one form or another. If they are theologians, they are likely to condemn themselves, teach condemnation, and advocate a fearful solution. Projecting condemnation onto God, they make him appear retaliative and fear his retribution. What they have done is merely to identify with the ego and by perceiving what it does, condemn themselves because of this confusion. It is understandable that there have been revolts against this concept, but to revolt against it is still to believe in it. Some newer forms of the ego's plan are as unhelpful as the older ones because form does not matter and the content has not changed. In one of the newer forms, for example, a psychotherapist may interpret the ego's symbols in a nightmare and then use them to prove that the nightmare is real. Having made it real, he then attempts to dispel its effects by depreciating the importance of the dreamer. This would be a healing approach if the dreamer were also identified as unreal. Yet if the dreamer is equated with the mind, the mind's corrective power through the Holy Spirit is denied. This is a contradiction even in the ego's terms, and one which it usually notes even in its confusion. If the way to counteract fear is to reduce the importance of the mind, how can this build ego strength? Such evident inconsistencies account for why no one has really explained what happens in psychotherapy. Nothing really does. Nothing real has happened to the unhealed healer, and he must learn from his own teaching. His ego will always seek to get something from the situation. The unhealed healer, therefore, does not know how to give and consequently cannot share. He cannot correct because he is not working correctly. He believes what is up to him to teach the patient. He believes that it is up to him to teach the patient what is real, although he does not know what is real himself. What then should happen? When God said, let there be light, there was light. Can you find light by analyzing darkness as the psychotherapist does, or like the theologian, by acknowledging darkness in yourself and looking for a distant light to remove it? 
healing is not mysterious. Nothing will change unless it is understood, since light is understanding. A miserable sinner cannot be healed without magic, nor can an unimportant mind esteem itself without magic. Both forms of the ego's approach then must arrive at an impasse, the characteristic impossible situation to which the ego always leads. It may help someone to point out where he is heading, but the point is lost unless he is also helped to change his direction. The unhealed healer cannot do this for him since he cannot do it for himself. And it, just to clarify, in case there's a little confusion, in this reference, what they're talking about, the unhealed healer, is either the theologian or the psychotherapist, or someone playing those roles, or, or any other kind of healing role, any other kind of, of uh, uh, person that you would go to for healing. They're just using these two as a good example. The unhealed healer cannot do this for, for you or for their subject because they cannot do it for themselves. The only meaningful contribution the healer can make is to present an example of one, of, of one of whose direction has been changed for him and who can no longer believes in nightmares of any kind. The light in his mind will therefore answer the questioner who must decide with God that there is light because he sees it. And by his acknowledgement, the healer knows it is there. That is how perception is ultimately translated into knowledge. The miracle worker begins by perceiving light and translates his perception into sureness by continually extending it and accepting its acknowledgement. Its effects assure him it is there. A therapist does not heal. He lets healing be. He can point to darkness, but he cannot bring light of himself, for light is not of him. Yet being for him, it must also be for his patient. The Holy Spirit is the only therapist. He makes healing clear in any situation in which he is the guide. You can only let him fulfill his function. He needs no help for this. He will tell you exactly what to do to help anyone he sends to you for help and will speak to him through you if you do not interfere. Remember that what you choose the guide, remember that you choose the guide for helping and the wrong choice will not help. But remember also that the right one will. Trust him for help is his function and he is of God. As you awaken other minds to the Holy Spirit through him and not yourself, you will understand that you are not obeying the laws of this world, but the laws you are obeying work. The good is what works, is a sound, though, though unsufficient. <laughs> the good is what works, quote, is a sound though insufficient statement. Only the good can work. Nothing else works at all. This course offers a very direct and very simple learning situation and provides the guide who tells you what to do. If you do not do it, it oh, if you do it, you will see it works. Its results are more convincing than words. They will convince you that the words are true. By following the right guide, you will learn the simplest of all lessons. By their fruits ye shall know them, and they shall know themselves. Section 6 of Chapter 9, The Acceptance of the Atonement the acceptance of your brother. How can you become increasingly aware of the Holy Spirit in, your, in you 
except by his effects. You cannot see him with your eyes, nor hear him with your ears. How then can you perceive him at all? If you inspire joy, and others react to you with joy, even though you are not experienced joy yourself, there must be something in you that is capable of producing it. If it is in you and can produce joy, and if you see that it does produce joy in others, you must be dissociating it in yourself. It seems to you that the Holy Spirit does not produce joy consistently in you only because you do not consistently arouse joy in others. Their reactions to you are your evaluations of his consistency. When you are inconsistent, you will not always give rise to joy. And so you will not always recognize this consistency. What you offer to your brother, you offer to him, because he cannot go beyond your offering in his giving. This is not because he limits his giving, but simply because you have limited your receiving. The decision to receive is the decision to accept. If your brothers are part of you, will you accept them? Only they can teach you what you are, for your learning is the result of what you taught them. What you call upon in them, you call upon in yourself. And as you call upon them, and as you call upon it in them, it becomes real to you. God has but one child, knowing them all as one. Only God himself is more than they, but they are not less than he is. Would you know what this means? If what you do to my brother, you do to me, and if you do everything for yourself because we are a part of you, everything we do belongs to you as well. Everyone God created is part of you and shares his glory with you. His glory belongs in him, but it is equally yours. You cannot then be less glorious than he is. God is more than you only because he created you, but not even this would keep him from you. Therefore, you can create as he did, and your disassociation will not alter his. Neither God's light nor yours is dimmed because you do not see. Because the sonship might create as one, you remember creation whenever you're rec you recognize part of creation. Each part you remember adds to your wholeness because each part is whole. Wholeness is indivisible, but you cannot learn of your wholeness until you see it everywhere. You can know yourself only as God knows his son, for knowledge is shared with God. When you awake in him, you will know your magnitude by accepting him limitless as yours by accepting his limitlessness as yours. But meanwhile, you will judge it as you judge your brothers and will accept it as his. You are not yet awake, but you can learn how to awaken. Very simply, the Holy Spirit teaches you to awaken others. As you see them awaken, you will hear what waking means. And because you have chosen to wake them, their gratitude and appreciation of what you have given them will teach you its value. They will become the witness to your reality as you were created witness to God's. Yet when the sonship comes together and accepts its oneness, it will be known by its creations who witness to its reality as the son does to the father. Miracles have no place in eternity because they are reparative. Yet while you still need healing, your miracles are the only witness to your reality that you can recognize. You cannot perform a miracle for yourself because miracles are a way of giving acceptance and receiving. In time, the giving comes first, though they are simultaneously in eternity where they cannot be separated. 
When you have learned that they are the same, the need for time is over. Eternity is one time, its only dimension being always. This cannot mean anything to you until you remember God's open arms and finally know his open mind. Like him, you are always in his mind and with a mind like his. In your open mind are your creations in perfect communication, born of perfect understanding. Could you but accept one of them, you would not want anything the world has to offer. Everything else would be totally meaningless. God's meaning is incomplete without you, and you are incomplete without your creations. Accept your brother in this world, and accept nothing else, for in him you will find your, his, your creations, because he created them with you. You will never know what your co-creator with God, you are a co-creator with God, until you learn that your brother is co-creator with you. Section 7 of Chapter 9, The Two Evaluations. God's will is your salvation. Would he not have given you the means to find it? If he wills you to have it, he must have made it possible and easy to obtain it. Your brothers and sisters are everywhere. You do not have to seek far for salvation. Every minute and every second gives you a chance to save yourself. Do not lose these chances, not because they will not return, but because delay of joy is needless. God wills you perfect happiness now. Is it possible that this is not also your will? And is it possible that this is not also the will of your brothers and sisters? Consider then that in this joint will you are all united, and in this only. There may be disagreement on anything else, but not on this. This then is where peace abides, and you abide in peace when you so decide. Yet you cannot abide in peace unless you accept the atonement, because the atonement is the way to peace. The reason is very simple and so obvious that it is often overlooked. The ego is afraid of the obvious, since obviousness is the essential characteristic of reality. Yet you cannot overlook it unless you are not looking. It is perfectly obvious that if the Holy Spirit looks with love on all he perceives, he looks with love on you. His evaluation of you is based on his knowledge of what you are, and so he evaluates you truly. And this evaluation must be in your mind, because he is. The ego is also your mind, because you have accepted it there. Its evaluation of you, however, is the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit's, because the ego does not love you. It is not aware of what you are, and wholly mistrustful of everything it perceives because its perceptions are so shifting. The ego is therefore capable of suspiciousness at best and viciousness at worst. That is its range. It cannot exceed it because it, of its... Ins, un, oh, let me try that again. It cannot exceed it because of its uncertainty, and it can never go beyond it because it can never be certain. You then have two conflicting evaluations of yourself in your mind, and they cannot both be true. You do not yet realize how completely different these evaluations are, because you do not understand how lofty the Holy Spirit's perception of you really is. He is not deceived by anything you do, because he never forgets what you are. The ego is deceived by everything you do, especially when you respond to the Holy Spirit, because at such times its confusion increases. The ego is therefore particularly likely to attack you 
when you react lovingly because it has evaluated you as unloving and you are going against its judgment. The ego will attack your motives as soon as they become clearly out of accord with its perception of you. This is when it will shift abruptly from suspiciousness to viciousness since its uncertainty is increased. Yet it is surely pointless to attack in return. What can this mean except that you are agreeing with the ego's evaluation of what you are? If you choose to see yourself as unloving, you will not be happy. You are condemning yourself and must therefore regard yourself as inadequate. Would you look to the ego to help you escape from a sense of, in, uh, from a sense of inadequacy it has produced and must be maintained for its existence? Can you escape from its evaluation of you by using its methods for keeping this practice intact? You cannot evaluate an insane belief system from within it. Its range precludes this. You can only go beyond it, look back from a point where sanity exists, and then see the contrast. Only by this contrast can insanity be judged as insane. With the grandeur of God in you, you have chosen to be little and to lament your littleness. Within the system that dictated this choice, the lament is inevitable. Your littleness is taken for granted there, and you do not ask who granted it. The question is meaningless within the ego's thought system because it would open the whole thought system to question. I have said that the ego does not know what the real question is. Lack of knowledge of any kind is always associated with unwillingness to know. And this produces a total lack of knowledge simply because knowledge is not total. Not to question your littleness, therefore, is to deny all knowledge and keep the ego's whole thought system intact. You cannot retain part of a thought system because it can be questioned only at its foundation. And this must be questioned from beyond it because within its foundation does stand. The Holy Spirit judges against the reality of the ego's thought system merely because he knows its foundation is not true. Therefore, nothing that arises from it means anything. He judges every belief you hold in terms of where it comes from. If it comes from God, he knows it to be true. If it does not, he knows that it is meaningless. Whenever you question your value, say, God himself is incomplete without me. That's beautiful. Remember this when the ego speaks and you will not hear it. The truth about you is so lofty that not wanting, that not, that nothing unworthy of God is unworthy, is worthy of you. Let me do that again. The truth about you is so lofty that nothing unworthy of God is worthy of you. Choose then what you want in these terms and accept nothing that you would not offer to God as wholly fitting for him. You do not want anything else. Return your part to him and he will give you all of himself in exchange for the return of what belongs to him and renders him complete. Acceptance of the Atonement, Chapter 9, Section 8, Grandeur versus Grandiosity. Grandeur is of God and only of God. Therefore, it is in you. Whenever you become aware of it, however dimly you abandon the ego automatically, because in the presence of the grandeur of God, the meaninglessness of the ego becomes perfectly apparent. When this occurs, even though it does not understand it, 
the ego believes that its enemy has struck and attempts to offer gifts to induce you to return to its protection. Self-infliction of the ego is its alternative to the grandeur of God. Which will you choose? Grandiosity is always a cover for despair. It is without hope because it is not real. It is an attempt to counteract your littleness based on the belief that the littleness is real. Without this belief, grandiosity is meaningless and you could not simply want it. The essence of grandiosity is competitiveness because it will always, it always involves attack. It is a delusional attempt to outdo, but not, but not to undo. We said before that the ego vacillates between suspiciousness and viciousness. It remains suspicious as long as you despair of yourself. It shifts to viciousness when you decide not to tolerate self-abasement and seek relief. Then it offers you the illusion of attack as a solution. The ego does not understand the difference between grandeur and grandiosity because it sees no difference between miracle impulses and ego alien beliefs of its own. I told you that the ego is aware of threat to its existence, but makes no distinctions between those two very different kinds of threat. In profound sense of vulnerability, its profound sense of vulnerability renders it incapable of judgment, except in terms of attack. When the ego experiences threat, its only decision is whether to attack now or to withdraw and attack later. If you accept its offer of grandiosity, it will attack immediately. If you do not, it will wait. The ego is immobilized in the presence of God's grandeur because his grandeur establishes your freedom. Even the faintest hint of your reality literally drives the ego from your mind because you will give up all investment in it. Grandeur is totally without illusions, and because it is it is real, it is completely convincing, compellingly convincing. Yet the conviction of reality will not remain with you unless you do not allow the ego to attack it. The ego will make every effort to recover and mobilize its energies against your release. It will tell you that you are insane and argue that grandeur cannot be a real part of you because of the limitlessness in which it believes. The, no, the littlestness. The ego will tell you that you are insane and argue that grandeur cannot be a real part of you because of the littleness in which it believes. Yet your grandeur is not delusional because you did not make it. You made grandiosity and you are afraid of it because it is an attack of form. But your grandeur is of God who created it out of his love. From your grandeur, you can only bless because your grandeur is your abundance. By blessing, you hold it in your mind, protecting it from illusions and keeping yourself in the mind of God. Remember always that you cannot be anywhere except in the mind of God. When you forget this, you will despair and you will attack. The ego depends solely on your willingness to tolerate it. If you are willing to look upon grandeur, your grandeur, you cannot despair, and therefore you cannot want the ego. Your grandeur is God's answer to the ego because it is true. Littleness and grandeur cannot coexist, nor is it possible for them to alternate. Littleness and grandiosity can and must alternate since both are untrue and therefore on the same level. Being the level of shift, it is experienced as shifting and extremes are its essential characteristic. Truth and littleness are denials of each other because grandeur is truth. Truth does not vacillate, it is always true. 
When grandeur slips away from you, you have replaced it with something you have made. Perhaps it is the belief in littleness. Perhaps it is the belief in grandiosity. Yet it must be insane because it is not true. Your grandeur will never deceive you, but your illusions always will. Illusions are deceptions. You cannot triumph, but you are exalted. And in your exalted state, you seek others like you and rejoice with them. It's easy to establish or to distinguish grandeur from grandiosity because love is returned and pride is not. Pride will not produce miracles and will therefore deprive you of the true witnesses to your reality. Truth is not obscure nor hidden, but its obviousness to you lies in the joy you bring to its witnesses who show it to you. They attest to your grandeur, but they cannot attest to pride because pride is not shared. God wants you to behold what he created because it is his joy. Can your grandeur be arrogant when God himself witnesses it? And what can be real that has no witnesses? What good can come of it? And if no good can come of it, the Holy Spirit cannot use it? What he cannot transform to the will of God does not exist at all. Grandiosity is delusional because it is used to replace your grandeur. Yet, the God has, yet what God has created cannot be replaced. God is incomplete without you because his grandeur is total and you cannot be missing from it. You are altogether irreplaceable in the mind of God. No one else can fill your part in it. And while you leave your part of it empty, your eternal place merely waits for your return. God, through his voice, reminds you of it, and God himself keeps your extensions safe within it. Yet you do not know them until you return to them. You cannot replace the kingdom, and you cannot replace yourself. God, who knows your value, would not have it so, and so it is not so. Your value is in God's mind, and therefore not in yours alone. To accept yourself as God created you cannot be arrogance because it is the denial of arrogance. To accept your littleness is arrogant because it means that you believe your evaluation of yourself is truer than God's. Yet if truth is indivisible, your evaluation of yourself must be God's. You did not establish your value and it needs no defense. Nothing can attack it nor prevail over it. It does not vary. It merely is. Ask the Holy Spirit what it is, and he will tell you, but do not be afraid of his answer, because it comes from God. It is an exalted answer because of its source, but the source is true, and so is its answer. Listen and do not question what you hear, for God does not deceive. He would have you place the ego's belief in littleness with his own exalted answer to what you are, so that you can cease to question it and know it for what it is. Excellent chapter. Um, one of the thoughts that I had as I was reading is uh, one of the mantras that I have that I'm working with lately is to attempt to respond to everything with love. It's that simple. If we make the effort to remember that we are love, that we are love in form, then no matter what happens, we can respond with love to whatever happens. And I mean even the little things, like slamming your finger in the door. Rather than becoming angry about that, 
respond with love to yourself. So the, you know, the normal reaction, if you, if you do something, break something, drop something, slam your finger in the door, whatever it might be, is to react negatively. So if we can develop the skill to pause and not react with our knee-jerk automatic reactions, which are the reactions of the ego, because it's the body. The ego is what's running the body, and that's what's in charge of the body and thinks it's in charge of everything. And, and, and um, if, we can, if we can focus and break that automatic response to become a considered response, that's all it takes to wake up, is just to wake up. And make sure that when you're responding, you're responding from your heart with choice. It's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, so if you'd like support, if you have questions, uh, you want to start a discussion, you can message me at 907-351-3003. And uh, this does conclude Chapter 9 in A Course in Miracles. And next Sunday, we will pick up with uh, Chapter 10. Until then, I see you, I see your wholeness, I understand your divinity and our oneness. Till next week, namaste.